favorite taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste. Welcome to Great Taste. I'm your host, Steve Boss. 60 Minutes of Deliciousness upcoming. We happen to be live, which means you guys have to... I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this again. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Great Taste. 60 minutes of deliciousness upcoming. We happen to be live from Green Building Supply. Okay. That was better. That was better. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I've already forgotten what I was supposed to do, which is I'm supposed to use this mic instead of the mic that that uh, the secondary one. So uh, anyway, I uh, really very thrilled to see all of you and those of you who are not here who are watching this or listening to it, um, this audience is already well fed because they have actually had some of the food that we're going to be making and uh, the rest of it will happen in just a little while. This is Christy Welsh. She is going to be making what? Tell us what you're making. I'm gonna be making a manamusler, which are a Swedish like almond shell that my grandmother made every Christmas. And we have one Swedish person in the audience, and the good news for Christy is that she's never made these. And have you ever eaten them either or not? You have eaten them. Okay, but you've never made them, so that's good. So, so she breathed the sigh of release, a le- relief. Christy breathed the sigh of relief because she was a little concerned. Now, um, how do you know me? How do I know you? Mm. Well... <laughs> I met you when I was 12 years old and you moved into my neighborhood and I came and introduced myself to you and said I could babysit and I did. And there you have it. And that was only five years ago. So, <laughs> so uh, we're going to get back to you in just a few minutes. Um, I have been making latkes because this happens to fall during the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah and fried foods are a traditional type of food that are made during this period. So latkes, potato pancakes, though we have been discussing the differences between those two things, uh, are one of those types of food. And uh, sufganiyot, which are donuts, are another. We're not making donuts, though I wish that somebody here was fantastic and could make those because that would be, I would like that even more than latkes. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about fried foods in, 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 a, in a few minutes, but before I do, I want to introduce Donald Revolinsky because we used the clarified butter or ghee uh, that his company makes to actually cook the latkes in. And I think, but you guys are gonna let me know that uh, they tasted pretty good. So if they did, you, don't, you, know, you can just clap, and if they didn't, you don't have, you can just sit there. So if they tasted pretty good, you can clap. So, right. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have shown you the door. So it's, you know, it's like, whatever. Donald, thanks for coming and welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Spring Sunrise. Sure. So it's a company um, my father started uh, in 1992 as sort of a side hustle. He was working at the university here um, and he started with Sprouts. Um, and then he went to granola and he, and, you know, it, it was sold at, uh, I guess it was called, what was it called before everybody's the Fairfield market. Yeah. He sold it at the Fairfield market, granola and sprouts. And then my mother actually wanted to buy someone else's business that w- that made this clarified butter. And they're like, you, you don't need to buy the business from us. You just, you just melts down butter and you take the, the oil out of, you know, the, the milk solids out of it and get rid of the water and, and put it in a jar. And it's like, oh, oh, okay. So we added ghee to it as sort of a an afterthought. I mean, we, my parents did. I was six years old at the time. Um, and it was, they kept going with it for, for 10 years. My dad very much disliked making sprouts, dropped that off. Um, about 10 years ago, he stopped making the granola, and the ghee has been sort of pretty steady. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it expanded to high V. You know, that was a big get for us. Um, and then all of a sudden, we were, in, um, we were in the new Pioneer Food Co-op in Iowa City, which we, where we still are. And um, slowly, you know, the, it, there's, some, there's some co-ops in different various towns in Chicago, in Milwaukee, in, you know, Midwestern cities. We were slowly expanding our network 
Um, but I think the big break came for us when Amazon went from, you know, selling books and electronics to selling everything. Once they started selling food, there was a, a gentleman who created a private label of ghee, his own label, like our, our ghee and our jar that he put his label on and paid us, you know, to just send it into Amazon for him so that he, you know, so the Amazon workers could fulfill it and he could manage his inv inventory online. That went spectacularly crazy on Amazon and to the point where we said, okay, we, you know, we're going about this the wrong way. We need to do this ourselves. Um, so we started getting on Amazon and then, be, uh, you know, we, we ended up um, going to some of these like national food fairs. Um, we got a, uh, 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 they're, they're called uh, AO2 Marketing. Um, they do all of our Amazon marketing. And we went from, you know, something like 10,000 in annual sales to, you know, we 15, X that in in the first year and it's and then the pandemic hit and then you know everyone was ordering on Amazon so th like we you know we 15 X again and all of a sudden you know we're hiring more people like the the amount of product you know uh, of raw ingredients that we're ordering goes way up and suddenly there's a business and now we have four full-time employees and my father and I and a couple of part-time people that roll through and you know it's all that we can do to fill all of our orders um yeah, that's that's our business. Okay, so yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. So I, I want to see if I have this, we'll say, ex marketing expansion correct or not, because it seems like that since you've been involved, there's been a diversification and we'll say a, a horizontal growth of line of product. That's so interesting because. For many years, you can tell us how many, it was simply clarified butter. It was simply ghee, right? And now there's brown butter ghee, there's basil ghee, right? There's um, ghee ghee, of course. Mm -hmm. There's still that. And there's some, something else, right? Cultured butter ghee, right? Exactly. Right. All those. Yeah. Um, you know, it, 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 we were seeing what our customers were asking for, I think, was the bottom line. Um, one thing for the brown butter ghee, for example, um, a, a bunch of we we sent a, a batch. Jan is here in the audience, one of uh, the, the everybody's uh, managers. Um, we sent a batch of of ghee. We, we you know because we just had the original ghee. The the I mean, if you want to grab the jar right there, it's this that this is this was the product for you know twenty plus years. Um, and so uh, one one batch we we kind of I, I wouldn't say we burned it, but definitely it was like dark. It was like, it was a little overcooked. It was like, can we even sell this? Like, I don't know if we can sell this. And so it's like, we'll just, we'll just give it to everybody. It's, you know, they do really good pushing our product. We'll, sit, we'll put it over there. Hopefully it'll be fine. And actually, not only was it fine, a number of folks were very enthusiastic about the, the slightly overcooked product. And it's like, oh, okay, that's very interesting. I don't know if we want to make all of our products like overdone like that, but that's, that's cool that, that some folks really liked it. Um, and I think the, the big breakthrough for us came when we just straight up full out burned a batch. Um, the, the urns that we use, they're, they're very finicky. Um, so, sometimes if, you, if you're adjusting the temperature settings, even just like a little millimeter on the temperature gauge, it suddenly the heat goes way up. And, you know, the same amount of time that you're cooking that batch gets the, there's a lot more heat gets into that, into that butter. And so it was burnt. It straight, it, we walked in, it smelled burnt. It was like a very intense smell. And it's like, what are we, you know, it, it, our batches are 500 pounds at a time. It's like, what are we going to do with this batch? You know, this is like the whole profit margin for all of the butter that we bought for the season, you know, potentially. Um, and uh, we, we just said, okay, we're, we're going to make a new product out of this. Like people liked it. Um, we, we sent it out to a few folks, you know, who liked it. It was like, is this acceptable? Like, would you buy this? And they're like, yeah, we really like this. This is amazing in cooking. It's like, okay, it's brown butter ghee. We just made brown butter ghee. And now, and now we have the formula down to, you know, to, to add more heat. We don't burn it in the same way, but we add more heat into the product um, for a longer period of time to cook it longer and get it to that nice toasty level, which does hopefully bring out the flavors in, in what you're cooking. It's very much a culinary ghee. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm so surprised you didn't call it burnt ghee, but yeah. I, I kind of understand why you would. Yeah. You know? um, but I, I, I love that 
you've diversified the line. And one of the things that I think that we need to mention is that your products are all certified organic. That's yeah, absolutely. That's correct. That was important to us. Um, just, you know, uh, having, because we're not, um, as big as some of the other gi companies in the United States, as many of the other gi companies in the United States, um, we had to sort of, um, hit a certain niche, which it was for us meant that it was like, it's a top shelf product. So we're finding the best quality butter that we can find. We're making sure that it's certified kosher, certified organic, and just giving people, you know, the best experience that we can give them, given that, you know, we can only bring our price down so low. And even if we found a similar, you know, kind of more grain fed butter, um, all of our butter is grass fed, by the way, and I can get into why that's important. And please do. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, the uh, even if we could find cheaper ingredients because we weren't ordering them in super large quantities, we just weren't going to be able to compete with you know, on price, you know, at that really low price point for ghee. I mean, if you walk into an Indian grocery, you look at swad ghee. You know, it, it depends on the, the location, but it's it's an inexpensive jar of ghee. And for folks who you know, use a lot of ghee, you know, you price matters, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, Indian Americans, you know, they might use a, a, a jar of, you know, 16 ounce, one of these jars of, of ghee every, every week, or even every couple of days if they have a big family. So it's, um, you know, it's important for them to have an affordable, um, product on the shelf. Um, but you know, we, we felt that, um, there was an, a niche, um, of, really high quality ghee that was not necessarily um, being hit, um, especially around here in the Midwest. So that's that's sort of where we've started and where we sort of kept our product. And sort of being certified organic is certainly part of that. Now, for grass-fed, um, we found that there's actually a real difference in the color of the ghee. Um, depending on grain fed or grass fed. So if you if you walk into a grocery store, I mean, even at Hy-Vee, there's, there's full circle ghee. A lot of the full circle ghee, especially in the wintertime, is gonna be pale. It's gonna look really pale. And that's a tell. That will tell you that it's grain fed butter. It means the cows, you know, probably live in a northern climate, maybe Wisconsin, maybe Iowa. You know, we have a three month winter out here. You can't, they can't be grazing during that time. And that's just the reality. And that's, that's okay. But um, we really wanted to find a source of butter that was grass fed year round. So even though folks, I know it's, it's a, seems to be an urban legend that Radiance Dairy supplies all of our, all of our butter. They don't actually make butter. Um, they only make milk. Um, and, and cheese and a couple other products, but um, they don't make butter. And um, we actually get our butter from Northern California, a dairy operation out there where the cows do have access to grass 300 plus days out of the year. Awesome. Yeah. So I know you have an 11 month old at home and you, you'd like to get back there. So is there anything else that you'd like to tell us before I let you exit <laughs> yeah i know just i uh, thanks for uh thanks for using the the product and uh, uh i think you guys are in for a treat with uh with uh, the the kyle and the kombucha here his his hedge apple company really good stuff yeah yeah donald? thank you donald it was yes. it was terrific if you, you have a question you such a great job the other week like last week when you explained culture oh, sure. okay so so let me just repeat that because you can't People wouldn't be able to hear that. So um, the question was, what's the difference between cultured ghee and the, we'll say, the regular product? Sure. So um, cultured ghee is a more traditional form of ghee. Um, if you think to South Asian cultures a couple hundred years ago, they were making ghee back then. That's where ghee comes from, is the South Asian cultures. Um, I'm talking about uh, a different kind of culture than cultured ghee. I'm talking about the actual, you know, the, the folks who lived in that area of the world comes from that area of the world. And a couple hundred years ago, they did not have refrigeration. So as soon as you make butter out of your milk, um, it's going to immediately start turning. Um, and you have to essentially go straight from butter and, and turn it into ghee. Um, and in the process, even, while it's sort of turning, you know, going bad, essentially, there's the, it's there's a process where it, it ferments and the fermentation um, a, 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 a gentle amount just like it will with kombucha is actually good for digestion is what we found now I have to uh, caveat this there isn't a lot of scientific study around cultured ghee specifically um, but we have found that um, a cultured ghee product 
does like from from personal experience it is a little bit gentler on the digestion um you know similar reasons why you might drink kombucha over like a, a you know a, a juice drink um you could use cultured ghee over regular ghee um it is we uh now it's at spring sunrise we culture we don't do that the same uh culture it the same way we use buttermilk organic buttermilk um, and we create our own culture essentially over uh, the course of three days. Um, and we let it, we, we warm the butter a bit. Um, we don't melt it all the way. And we add in the buttermilk. We let it ferment for three days. And then we melt it all down and turn it into ghee. Um, and um, it gives it a little bit of a, a slightly sour note to it. Um, and it, it definitely has the desired effect. Um, and we, you know, it's definitely our best seller after the original ghee. Now, I'm going to say the same thing I, I said really about, you know, you could have called it burnt <laughs> ghee instead of, you know, how about controlled spoilage ghee? You know, th did you ever consider that name before? Uh, Steve, you, uh, you got many talents. I, I don't, don't go into marketing, though. <laughs> <laughs> Does that qualify for, uh, for people who are lactose intolerant? So the question yeah. is, uh, is the cultured ghee okay for people who are lactose intolerant yeah so that actually it's important to get into like what is ghee ghee is a type of clarified butter and clarified butter is um a process by which you add heat to just regular butter um and when you add heat to regular butter um things start to separate out the, the water will in the butter will boil off completely um and then the casein in milk solid which is where all of the lactose is um will separate out from the golden oil. And as long as you have, you know, it, it looks brown, like, like uh, I, I, our ghee won't, probably won't have it, but there'll be like brown spots on the bottom of the jar that's actually, it's denser than the oil, so it will fall to the bottom. And that stuff is going to be the lactose. Um, but technically speaking, ghee is lactose free. So cultured ghee, even brown butter ghee will be lactose free. Um, and um, I have, you know, again, uh, this is just a, a, like a, a personal aside, but I have a friend who's like extremely lactose intolerant. Um, she, she will, you know, need to visit, visit a hospital. If she has a glass of milk, she uses ghee. So, yeah. All right. Thanks so much. Get back to your uh, young one. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you. So the, the great thing for everybody that's, that's here live is that uh, Donald has given us four different jars to give away later. So maybe so, well, some of, four of you are going to be lucky. Let's put it that way. Christy, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, these cookies that you're going to make and uh, give us a, you know, just a preview of the process? Sure. So um, these cookies, as you can see here, I'll hold up this box. Um, so some people will be li listening only on the radio eventually. All so, right. Well, if you're... So just describe the box, too, <laughs> and what's in it. I have a box of uh, Swedish tins that are, you know, they look kind of look like a ruffly. And you put the, you press the dough into it, and it makes a shell, um, a almond shell cookie. Um, okay, now... And those tins are, were from oh, your they, grandmother, they right? They were my grandmother's actual tins. I'm not using them tonight, but these uh, came from her house. So they're pretty special to me. Um, my grandma made these every year at Christmas. And I will sh I, uh, when she taught me how to make them, she was doing it all from her head. So I have the recipe written down, but no instructions because she was so fast <laughs> at doing it. But I figured it out. I mean, it's very simple. It's just um, almonds flour, butter, eggs, and sugar, and a little bit of salt. So it's very a very simple dough to put together. And you press it, and you bake it, and then, oh, you can fill it. Now, my grandmother, we never filled them. Um, but we, are, we have some jam here tonight and some whipped cream cheese that we're going to, that you can fill if you want, I guess, when you eat the cookies. All right. So do you want to show us the, what I don't know what you had in mind. Do you want to show the process or how, how do you want to yeah. see this I evolving? Think. So um, I did run a bowl. I am not going to use a mixer. I'll just do it all by hand. So I have a cup of butter softened and I did um, pre-measure everything. When I made the I will talk about the almonds a little bit. So I blanched the whole almonds. Um, and peeled them 
and then ran them through a food processor to to uh, uh, grind them up fine. You can see this. That will go in. Um, so I'm putting the butter in here. So let's do the measurements. So what, what oh, yeah. they're going to need if they want to do this at home, and this is this is really easy. Like it's a very said. easy recipe. Right. So they're going to need what? So it's a, it's a cup of butter, which is two sticks, mm -hmm. um, a half a cup of ground almonds, mm -hmm. two cups of flour, and three quarters cup of sugar and one egg. And I always do the um, the butter and the sugar together first to cream them, and then um, I'll add the egg in. And then I'll do the almonds and the flour. Okay, so you're going to cream the butter and the sugar together first. Yeah. And then after that, you're going to add the almonds, you said, and the egg. the egg at the same time? I'll do the egg first. Do the egg first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's just the egg yolk, right? Oh, yeah. It's just the egg yolk. Right. So only an egg yolk. Mm -hmm. So while you're doing that, I'm going to um, introduce Kyle Seek okay. to talk a little bit. But if you're coming to a step, that's important that everybody sees, just interrupt me, just pat me on the shoulder or something. And uh, okay. by the way, as we try to do always with, with everything that we cook here, all the ingredients are organic ingredients. So yes. so Kyle, would you like to come up? And, <laughs> and Kyle Seek makes hedge apple kombucha, which many of you have, have had. There seems to be a tiny bit left, I hope. There'll still be a tiny bit left at the end of the evening, so I can have some of that. And I don't know about those of you here, but this is a refrain that I've heard over and over again. I mentioned it to Kyle yesterday, actually, and that is, I don't like kombucha, but I really love hedge apple kombucha. Oh, oh, you hear that all the time too, right? Yeah, and my wife's that on that page. You said it, you said it, okay. So lots of people are on the same page. They don't like kombucha for whatever reason, you know? Yeah, go ahead. I don't like hops at all, and I love the pineapple hops oh. kombucha. So obviously, you, you come a little closer. I'm not going to bite, I promise. Uh, you, you must be doing something right. I hope so, yeah. Um, yeah, I just started putting out whatever I knew how to make, and people seemed to like it. Um, I tried to carbonate it as much as I could, and people complimented me how low the carbonation was and how they liked it. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'll just settle with what I have the ability to put out. And the carbonation world, world. Um, yeah, we use 100% organic ingredients. We use Frontier Co-op teas. I uh, have a, a blend of tea that I think is maybe why people like it. Uh, it's really smooth. We use jasmine green tea as our part of our green tea, which is, um, you know, floral and flowers and smooth. And I don't think any other mainstream green uh, kombucha uses jasmine. So there's one of my secrets, I guess. But there's some other things. I think you have another secret, too, and that is that you have actual a uh, real partner in this, too. Mm. And that, that's a big secret. Yeah. Yeah. My wife, um, uh, she's an herbalist and uh, midwife. And uh, I come from uh, a food truck, a, a taco burrito food truck background. And so um, but also herbalism and permaculture and growing food and gardening. Uh, I had my first garden at, at uh, Lonnie Gamble's homestead. Lonnie and Valerie's. So, and those of you who are listening, <laughs> Kyle's pointing at Lonnie and Valerie in the audience. And, um, and I have a quick side note, funny story. When I, I met you my first, like my second day in Fairfield when I was at their Big Green Summer internship, and we were picking food in Valerie's greenhouse, and we were supposed to make a meal as like a, our activity. And I pulled out some like textured vegetable, like soy crips, like some like really low value bulk food item. And you told me like, no, we're not going to use that in our, in our collaborative meal. So that was just like a funny memory I had. It's just, I met this, you know. I got a guy with his nose in the air, you know. know this like food aficionado. And I'm like, here, I have some like tofu crisps. Let's cook with it. He's like, no. I'm like, okay, all right. I never bought those again after that, by the, by the way. So. Well, listen. Let, you you kind of made light of the oh hold on one second. I'm just gonna add, add the almonds here and then I'll add in the flour. Okay, so, so do you want to? Oh, you want to? I think most people know what cream butter looks like, yeah. but but if they don't know, I mean, you know, yeah. if you're listening to this, you can Google it or whatever <laughs> and see what cream butter looks like. But uh, probably all of you know anyway. So now you're just adding the almonds to yeah. it. Okay, great. So here here's the thing. You you glossed over this, but you had a thriving food business before. Thank you. That's yeah. Um. The business was called Local Burrito. I was uh, I was making breakfast burritos at the Iowa City Farmers Market for about ten years, using exclusively locally sourced farm to table ingredients. We had a food truck. I catered weddings, and then in 2020, we sort of 
I don't know, a lot of people took that opportunity to re about, redesign their lives, reassess what they're up to. And I like to say we had a, a portal that we walked through and that led, this, led us to Fairfield. And now we have a small homestead on the north side of town where we have 13 acres and chickens and planting trees and gardening and all that stuff. And so I was just ready for a change. And the first year that we were here, I was really soul searching, like, what am I gonna do? I don't wanna be a, f a food trucker anymore. Thought about buying a dump truck to do like landscaping. And then I've got an opportunity to rent a kitchen at Breadtopia. And so we jumped at it and like, all right, maybe we can just make our rent and have enough kombucha to drink for our friends and ourselves. And then before we know it, we started canning. And then it's just been like, this year's just been crazy. I don't mean, I've lost track of how many hundreds of gallons we've canned already. So we're just going, going with it. And you were telling me yesterday that, I mean, I, I, I'll phrase it this way. You may you know, have a different way of looking at it, but there's that, that's the bad news and the good news. I mean, mm. business is great, but that means that you have to make other decisions, mm. like you can't continue probably to expand if you continue to can everything by hand. Sure. Yeah, we're in a kind of an exciting uh, fa uh, growth period. We're looking to build a bigger walk-in cooler and buy like a $40,000 canning machine, which allow us to make like um, 20 cans a minute Right now, we're making two cans a minute, maybe. <laughs> Depends on all the dishes that go into all the things, you know, mopping the floor and stuff. So, yeah, and it allows one person to, to can it rather than two people side by side. And there's a lot of efficiencies that can be made when you do larger batches. Right now, we can out of kegs that are, like, on the floor next to our canning machine just out of a picnic tap. So it's really inefficient, but it's just the only way we know how to do it, and we've learned ways to do it differently. You need some salt? Where's the salt? Here's the salt right here. I'll give it to you. And yeah, so now we're just, um, yeah, we're, yeah, we're looking to capitalize and grow a little bit and invest in ourselves. So for those people who may not have any idea what kombucha is, if you would just give us a little peek into that world. Yeah. So kombucha is a fermented tea. It's uh, originated in China, Russia, um, hinterland, 3,000 years it's been around at least. I would love to taste it, what it was like back then, see how, how far it's come. But yeah, it's the symbiotic uh, dance of yeast and bacteria. When you make kombucha, uh, the yeast is the first thing that uh, creates the, literally it takes, it, it turns the sugar into ethanol, and then the bacteria, the acetobacteria, takes the ethanol and con converts it into acetic acid, which is vinegar. So it's a balance of yeast and bacteria making uh, a beverage, and it it's probiotic, it's very good for digestion, and uh, it gives a lot of people an alternative to drinking. Like I used to be maybe a, a beer or two a day every once in a while. Now I, I just drink kombucha every day and I'm satisfied. And so that's allowed me to, I don't have like the beer weight anymore. Uh, you know, when you live, if you eliminate daily drinking, I think it's good for you. So I'm happy that I'm able to, like the pineapple hops, I'm trying to create like IPA style beers or kombuchas that are like beer, but they're non-alcoholic. So that's one way for me to try to contribute to health and prosperity and good things for people. So yeah, I, I think it, what's, what's fascinating about that to me is that that was my first reaction to it. Mm. After tasting it, it was like, oh, somebody could actually enjoy this mm -hmm. as uh, a substitute yeah. for beer if they like beer. And now I've got it in my head that this is Kyle's first go at this, so it's just gonna get more interesting as time goes on because you are always refining you know, what you do. And, and I love that about you. Just yesterday, we were talking about your mango and you said, oh yeah, next time it's gonna be blah, 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 you know, whatever. And, and I, I think that that's probably another reason that everybody likes your stuff is thank because you. they can feel the passion in it. Yeah, thank you. Is there a question in there? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, but but Christy wants me, so <laughs> hold on a second. second. So I did add all of the flour, and I have this is what the dough um, turns out to be. So what kind of texture is it, so people can um, can understand? It's it's similar to like a sugar cookie okay. recipe. Okay, sh like a shortbread or sugar. Don't let don't let me put words in your mouth. I've never made shortbread, so I can't answer that. I've made shortbread. Oh, okay. My wife says it's similar to shortbread. Okay. So if, if you're familiar, if people are familiar with that, it's like that. So so actually, the dough, I don't want to touch it. So what is it? Does it, 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 it it's, what's the feel of it? You're not going to be able, you're not telling me. 
Yeah. Well, I'm trying to okay. decide. I mean, to me, it's like Play-Doh. It's dough. I don't. I don't know yeah. how else to it's, explain. Yeah. What dough it, feels look, like. it, it sticks together, but it doesn't stick to you. For example, yeah. you know, so it, it has a nice consistency that um, feels like a little bit like Play-Doh, but it's not sticking to to your fingers, for That's example, right. or anything like that. There's enough butter in it; it won't stick. Right. <laughs> Excellent. And so, so the next step, so the next step is actually we're supposed to chill this for 30 minutes at least, and. Um, I have some chilled in here. Already. Ah, so smart, huh? Mm-hmm. This is how a real cooking show, not this show, but that's how a real cooking show works, actually. So, so I didn't ask you a question. So uh, where I want to go from, from there is that this is really how I would just say exceptional products are created because they're created not only by the ingredients that go into them, but also that there's this not just a level of passion, mm-hmm. but there's a real love for what the craft, mm-hmm. I, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that's what I noticed about your stuff, you know, right away when you talk and how you go about explaining and expressing, mm-hmm. you know, what it is that you're trying to, to get after. So again, there's no question in there. <laughs> nice. So, okay. So what's, so what do you want me to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're supposed to say, yeah, you know, uh, I, I, my wife and I love this, and we're so into it, and it's... I can talk about what makes us special, what I feel what makes us special. Um, like, for example, this Rishi Rose kombucha, uh, we sort... This is a side tea that we do. Uh, most all our flavors come from our base tea, which is a jasmine tea and a black tea blend. But this Rishi Rose has pu'er tea, which is like a five-year aged tea, and there's no jasmine in it. And we actually ferment organic uh, reishi mushrooms into it. When you ferment mushrooms, they're more medicinal. So that's why we make sure we go through the effort to do that. And then we add more reishi mushrooms when we can it because it gives it the, a caramel flavor. When you smell smoked or uh, dried reishi, it actually smells like caramel. It's really interesting. So then we soak, we take that and then we soak uh, organic rose petals into it. So there's like a lot of rose petals that go into our kegs. So that's something that my wife designed from her. I don't know, just from her, her playbook of things that she likes in her life and that she knows other women like. So those are some of the things that are guiding us. And then last month, our flavor was golden spice. This was a, a golden milk inspired kombucha without the milk, but just like the turmeric and ginger and, and, and spices. But this was designed to come out during cold and flu season when people might need some immunity, like turmeric, anti-inflammatory, ginger, kind of like building the heat inside your body. So these are like... This is inspired by herbalism and Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, all the things. So we really enjoy doing that. And this month, juniper pomegranate, we actually picked the, the, the juniper berries off our, off our tree, eastern red cedar on our property, mashed them with a rolling pin, and extracted like the essence of – it tastes like you're drinking a, a, like a pine tree. With, and then we have uh, pomegranate juice to be brought from everybody <laughs> to, to help round out the pine flavor. So – we're trying to use local food. We're trying to inc- think about medicinal uses beyond just fruit. And like a lot of kombucha is like fruit punch focused, four or five different fruits. We try to use maybe one fruit and then make multiple herbs. So that's what motivates us and something that I like. And there are a couple other things that I happen to know. One is that you did a strawberry lemon. Was that it over the summer? Uh, was it a strawberry lemon? lemon or strawberry lemon balm. And your kids and your wife went and picked all the strawberries, yeah. organic strawberries for that. Yeah. And you do uh, Picard's Escape, which is uh, on tap at uh, Paradiso, Cafe Paradiso. And uh, if, if people want it, sometimes they can get, you, you can fill up some for them. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic kombucha. But here's the thing about Kyle. So it's, it's uh, does everybody rem- know? Jean-Luc Picard, what his favorite drink was, what he drank all the time, right? Earl Grey Hot. That's, that was always on Star Trek, right? He went to the replicator and he, he ordered Earl Grey Hot, right? And um, Earl Grey tea has what in it? Bergamo. bergamo, right. Do you know where Kyle sources his bergamo peel, his organic bergamo peel from Italy? So uh, that's, that's how focused on creating the best uh, this guy is. And so thank you so much for coming. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for um, trying our kombucha. Buy it around town. And uh, we have a subscription service that ships anywhere in the, in this, in the country. Eight, eight cans a, a month. Okay, so hold up. on. We have a question. Um, go ahead. I'll, I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Kyle, could you talk a little bit about how you developed your root beer? Because it's one of the mm. best root beers I've ever had. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, so... so. If, if it wasn't kombucha, the, it would just be a really great root beer. 
Okay, so the question was uh, that you had a root beer flavored yep. kombucha, and yes. the question was how did you develop that? Because it was so amazing. Yeah, uh, my wife developed it, so that's that's why it's so amazing. Um, <laughs> I hope she will, better make sure she sees this. No. You better make sure. I mean, <laughs> it'll be up on uh, Fairfield Media Center's YouTube channel in a couple of days, right? Yeah. So, so uh, you, she can definitely see it there. Well, it's, what's fun about root beer is that root beer actually used to be medicinal. It was made from roots. It was something really good for you, like doctors and herbalists would make it. And we actually went back and reverse engineered, you know, root beer, sassafras, licorice root, sarsaparilla, ginger. Um, but then we added, we actually got chaga mushroom and pulverized it for like, uh, for like the caramelizing color. Like we had no colors or anything to it. And it came out looking just like root beer, a little bit of froth. Uh, we put a little bit of vanilla in there. Uh, roasted dandelion root. Uh, I'm probably forgetting a couple, but yeah, it was just. Uh, How, what was the process? I mean, the process. You, you didn't make that just like yeah. That the first no, time. It, that was probably one of the most complicated ones we've done. The process begins by, hey, we have an idea. Let's throw a few things in a jar. Which, which put a lot of things in a jar <laughs> and have it seal bad a taste, and put a little, a little amount of things in a jar and seal bad a taste, and then we sort of find the middle path. We sort of like, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, so it's, I think it took like three or four time batches to get the root beer tasting how we liked it. And yeah, it's just tweaking, keeping notes, uh, measuring everything to the gram, like weighing everything. Um, yeah, so it's a, yeah, I'm learning. It's kind of a lot of pressure because we, we come out with a new flavor every month and I'm pretty much like learning how to do it right before I put it out. So it's, uh, yeah. It's experimental. If you don't like it, it'll be gone in you know a couple of weeks. So <laughs> if you like it, you know buy it all. Then I'll just get working on the next thing. So, so, so I I, I think that the the only other thing I want to mention is I'm certainly not a kombucha. Yeah, I'm not an expert in anything, but I'm definitely not an expert in kombucha. But I've tasted a lot of different kombuchas in different parts of the country because there are many different parts of the country. They have their own local kombucha makers, yeah. and I think in general one of the things that's always off to me anyway, is there's too much vinegar, there's too much mm. acid, yeah. you know, that you, that you get. And yours is balanced so nicely always. And then some other ones, you know, it might be too much of the sweet yeah. taste. And I think that maybe is the word that I, I would like to use is that mm. when you get that recipe dialed in, there seems to always be a nice balance that's yeah. there. So if you like that tartness or that acidy thing, then there's, there is that vinegar hint there, right? And if you like that sweetness, there's that sweetness hint there. But nothing is shouting, you know, no, it's me, it's me, it's me. It's all saying, hey, we're playing together, we're all having fun. Yeah, yeah. the, the acid level, the vinegar component is the number one thing that people don't like about kombucha. So when I do sampling, people are like, no, I don't like that. And then we share some and then they walk away with the four pack. It was like, it's a really, it's a great exchange. and. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's not always perfect. I, I've, I've had the dump batches. Uh, my kitchen's in the middle of a, a flour factory, essentially. So there's yeast in the air. And I think, my, you know, my starter culture is changing. Like my kombucha acts differently from batch to batch, which makes it extra complicated because I'm working with an evolving living biological fluid and doing the best I can. But at the end of the day, it sort of has a mind of its own. So uh, I don't have it figured out yet. And it's, yeah. So. I, I think we'll just continue to enjoy your adventure. Right, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. All right. <laughs> okay, what do we, where, do we, where are we here? Oh, you're filling the tins now. And, and so all you're doing is you're taking that dough so just a little bit? I um, have been cutting, you know, kind of like shaving off some dough from this dough ball here um, and putting them into or making a little dough ball. And then inside the tin... You push down with my thumbs and work the way up the sides of the tin so that it gets into each crevice. And then if I need to add some more into it, I will, like this one. Because you have the tin, you didn't have to put any oil on them? or they're, the batter's do, do you need to um, they, butter the tins or not? These do not need to be buttered. There's so much butter in the dough that they don't stick. They might be a little bit, sometimes they might be a little challenging to get out, but... They can be cantankerous a little bit. They can be cantankerous, yeah, that's yeah. a good way to put it. Cool. Cool. So, um, I'm going to leave you to that, and you know I'm right here, so you can just nudge me or whatever when you have something to say. Uh, so the other component that all of you had, except for a couple of people who came in extra special late, we'll say, um, you already had latkes, 
potato pancakes and applesauce and uh, some sour cream. And so I wanted to just uh, tell you a little bit about the process of doing that because I had a lot of questions earlier from people about um, the latkes. The traditional recipe, or we'll say the, the most popular recipe, if you like to use the New York Times, um, is uh, uses potatoes and flour, salt, uh, onion, and eggs. And um, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't like that recipe. Uh, so uh, it's it's done for one really important reason, and that is that it, it's really it helps the potato pancakes, the latkes, stick together really easily, and you have less fuss, right? But I only use the potatoes and salt and pepper and onion. I don't use anything else. I don't use flour to bind it. I don't use eggs to bind it. And so you have to be really patient, and you have to um, be okay with the fact that um, sometimes it may not turn out right, and other times um, you'd like it to be done quicker, and it's not going to do that because in order to turn them properly, you have to give them plenty of time so that they're really well cooked before you flip them. Uh, and if you do give them the time, if you're patient, then you don't need any binder whatsoever. And for me, I like that because it gives the pure essence in terms of the taste of potato and of the couple of other ingredients that you put in there, salt, pepper, and the onion. Um, so it's not to say one recipe is better than the other. It's just my personal preference as far as um, how I like my potato pancakes. And, and I've made them all, all different ways. And I also tried this time, I, I did some, not tonight, but um, I did some with leek, some with white onion, some with shallot. And uh, my taste buds probably are just not refined enough to notice any significant difference between those. So, so whatever you like, uh, uh, I think it will probably work. And the applesauce is a great foil, you know, because you have the crispness of the, of the latka, which should always be eaten warm, which is why we did, did it the way we did it to, uh, at the show, where when you came in, we tried to give you some, a warm latka uh, before the show started. And um, a lot of people have very, very, um, we'll say, uh, specific ideas of what their applesauce should be like, right? I like my applesauce chunky. I like my applesauce totally smooth. I like my applesauce with cinnamon. I like it with a lot of sugar, whatever. Um, but with a latka, because it has this texture that has a lot of crispness to it, I like applesauce that is has been put through a food mill. And I was actually going to uh, make some applesauce, but I forgot that I was going to do that so, and show you uh, how to do it. So I guess that won't happen tonight. But... Uh, this is just a simple food mill. It was invented in the, what was it, the 1920s or something like that? I can't remember, in, in Belgium, actually. And it's great to make uh, applesauce because you don't have to peel the apples. What's the real word? You just have to, hmm? What's the real word? The real word is food mill. Uh, we looked it up just to verify. <laughs> Sorry, I think you brand, something Yeah, don't, don't say it. I, I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going into it. <laughs> um, That'll be the last time you're here on the show, huh? <laughs> um, anyway, it's a very simple apparatus. It's great to, you, you, as I said, you don't need to peel the apples. So you just put them in here after they're cooked and you just use the, the mill, turn it, and the skins get left behind, but you've gotten all the good stuff out of them. And in addition to that, uh, it makes for a really nice texture, at least in my opinion. Um, and then the sour cream also is another uh, layer of flavor and a difference in terms of the, um, the tang that, that mixes in with it. Because the applesauce, these were, this was nothing but Pink Lady apples, nothing other than that, just the Pink Lady apples. And so they were really sweet, which you probably noticed, right? And the sour cream adds tang. So you have all those different things going on on your plate, which, which I think is fun. Um, so I highly recommend uh, this type of, of uh, activity at this time of year. I never make latkes at any other time of the year. It's very kind of funny in a way. And the tradition of frying foods has, uh, is a very uh, old tradition in um, Jewish culture, actually. Um, in Rome, especially, I was just reading an article in the uh, New York Times that uh, this was one of the professions, being a, essentially a friar, 
was one of the professions that Jews were allowed to um, have during the time, the 300 years that the Jewish people in Rome were confined to what was called the Jewish ghetto, so a very specific area. And so one of those professions was uh, a cook. Uh, that was allowed for them to do, and they became proficient. There was a group. There were groups of uh, of cooks who became proficient at frying vegetables and frying fruits. And today, that culture is still very much alive. We were just in Rome a few weeks ago and had uh, the traditional, was well, a very uh, uh, iconic uh, carciofi alla Judea, which is Jewish style artichokes, which are fried artichokes. And um, that wasn't the best thing that we had uh, in in the uh, what's called the Jewish quarter, actually, not the Jewish ghetto any longer. Um, and, and I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, this this tradition is, is very much still uh, not only appreciated but well known today. Um, anytime you see a list of the restaurants that you need to go to if you're going to Rome, you're always going to find in that list some one, two places that are in the Jewish quarter that specialize in these types of uh, uh, fried foods. So the this experience that I want to relate, and we, we loved it, it was great, but the experience I want to relate, uh, there was a baking experience in the Jewish quarter that I won't relate right now, but uh, maybe at some other time we had fantastic pastry that as was said in, in, um, in this expert that I looked to, Katie Parla, I said, it doesn't taste anything like what you think it's going to taste like, which was, was quite extraordinary. But I want to talk about something else because it was a wake-up call to me uh, that has to do a little bit with what uh, Kyle related uh, regarding somebody who just you know, looked at an ingredient that, that uh, he showed, which was soy protein, textured vegetable protein, and, and said, eh, forget that. We're not using anything like that. You know, some people are you know, rude like that, maybe. <laughs> I don't want to mention any names. But anyway, um, what? There's a comment. Are you going to explain the significance of why there's fried food during... Oh, I guess, oh, you're right. Yeah, okay, so, so thankfully, you know, just like your wife, you said that Kyle told me yesterday that he's the doer and his wife is actually the brains behind everything, you know, and I, that's the same in my marriage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is totally the brains. <laughs> and so she just said, can you explain why fried foods play a role in the festival of Hanukkah? And it's because um, the legend, we'll say, uh, has to do with the fact that when um, the, uh, at this particular period of time in history, when uh, the leaders of the Jewish people overthrew the, um, the, um, huh? when they overthrew their oppressors of the moment, we'll say, um, at that time, uh, and they wanted to rededicate the temple, and they went to uh, light the lights, uh, one of the lights that's always uh, around at the temple is the eternal light, it's supposed to burn all the time, and they only found enough oil for one day. And it was going to take time to send whoever, you know, John or whomever out to go find some more oil somewhere. And uh, that oil particularly uh, at that time lasted for eight days. And so Hanukkah is eight days long. And that's a really nice story. Um, I, I don't want to talk about the veracity of it because <laughs> I'm not sure you can find anything in the history books that could actually prove something like that. But I, I like the story. It's a nice story. All right. So I have all of filled all of the shells with the dough, and I'm gonna bake it in the oven for 12 to 15 minutes at 350 degrees. Perfect, and when you guys taste this, you're gonna love it, because it's just like a short, wonderful shortbread cookie with almond, and it's, it's really lovely. And then we're gonna use, I wanna mention this because we're almost out of time, but there are so many fantastic local businesses in town, and uh, I got a chance to talk to the owner of this particular business, which I don't even know, does it have a name? Not yet. Okay, so it doesn't have a name yet, but he's making all these fantastic um, organic products, including uh, I, I have, um, what do I have? What's Mango chutney, which we ate like half of yesterday, and there also was uh, something else. The burf, burfi, right. So a dessert cookie was uh, fantastic. And uh, he was kind enough to bring um, a couple of his 
concoctions, apricot cranberry, that we're going to mix in with some of the cream cheese, the whipped cream cheese, to fill this. So that'll be really good. And you're going to be on the show sometime soon, right? So that'll be great. That'll be, that'll be awesome. Anyway, real quick story before Jason cuts me off. And, and, and that is that um, the first time we went to the Jewish Quarter uh, in this trip, there was a shop in one of the piazzas that uh, had a little, what do they call those, little sandwich board, right, outside, and it was advertising 100% uh, vegan gelato. Well, Mr. TVP, uh, toxic, looked at that sign and said, oh, I'm out. <laughs> Forget it. 100% vegan gelato? I don't want any of that. You know, so I walked away. So lucky for me, I came back to that piazza on another visit. I don't know why we were there again a couple of days later. And right, somebody, oh yeah, one of, the, one of our friends wanted to go to a store that was right near there. <laughs> and I saw the sign this time, and I said, hey, you know what, let's, let's just go in there. So I went in there with our, our friend, and it wasn't just 100% vegan gelato, but there were, it was 100% vegan everything, vegan uh, chocolate candies, vegan drinks, everything was vegan. And so... I was saying, okay, let's try some of this stuff. Let's see what, what, what this is about. And I have to just tell you that it was such a wonderful um, learning experience for me to, to be able to get over my initial reaction to that type of stuff because I've tasted so much of it and it's just horrible, you know, for the most part. Um, and to meet somebody like the people that have been up here tonight, like Donald Revolinsky and Kyle Seek, who are so passionate and amazing uh, in terms of the products that they're creating. And this gentleman who owned this particular store, he does the same thing. You know, he sources everything. And um, so we had, we ordered this, uh, or we tasted this hazelnut truffle. And I said to the guy, I said, oh, and are the hazelnuts, you know, from Piemonte? Because the people in Piemonte say that theirs are the best hazelnuts, right? And he looks at me and he goes, no. And I said, luckily I knew a little bit. I said, oh, are these from Viterbo? And he said, yes, because Viterbo is in Lazio, which is where Rome is, right? And everybody's very territorial in Italy, for sure. And so, of course, the hazelnuts in Piemonte aren't going to be as good as the hazelnuts in Viterbo. So anyway, the point is that everything was amazing. If you ordered a drink that was made with uh, cashew milk or ordered a drink that was made with almond milk, they didn't, didn't come in an aseptic container, the almond milk and the cashew milk. They made it all right there. They made their almond milk fresh. They made their cashew milk fresh. What was extraordinary to me is that I, I certainly haven't been in all these shops, and some of you probably have been in shops in other places. I've never seen anything like that, you know, in the United States where somebody went to that kind of care to create these products that were simply extraordinary uh, on all levels. So I just want to give a shout out to um, it's always good to keep your mind open and uh, be uh, really uh, eager to be curious and to learn. And uh, I'm certainly somebody that, that needs to learn that all the time. So thank you so much for being here. It's been so much fun. Thank you if you're listening. Thank you if you're watching. Uh, Jason Strong has uh, contributed his time and engineers this broadcast, and we really appreciate it. Green Building Supply uh, gives us this home. Everybody's Whole Foods provides us with all kinds of everything all the time, and we're very, very thankful. I'm Steve Boss. You've been listening or watching Great Taste, 60 Minutes of Deliciousness. Sweet Sour So good to taste